How you doing today, Brian? Well, you know, there's been uh, a lot on my mind that, uh, you know, for years had been the type of thing that, uh, you know, I had cultivated and curated for uh, my own uh, disaster uh, preparedness. Um, and now it's come full force with everything that's going on in the world. So I think it's appropriate that we ended up having uh, a special guest today who is not only an author uh, and, you know, quite an accomplished thinker, but also the, the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, Dr. Gleb Sipersky. Yeah, no, and it, the, the, this is just an irony of this interview. Here we are recording this on March 20th, 2020. Um, and we booked this interview two months ago. Um, that's how high in demand and and how knowledgeable um, Dr. T is. So with that, I'd say let's just let the listeners get into the content because it's some good stuff and I don't want them to miss anything. Right there with you. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Lead.exe. I'm Brian Comerford in Denver, Colorado. And I'm Nick Lozano in Washington, D.C. And we're thrilled to have with us today special guest, Dr. Gleb Sipersky, and uh, uh, who is uh, both the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, as well as uh, a very busy speaker, uh, <laughs> thought leader, uh, and author of a number of books, including Never Go With Your Gut, uh, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disaster. So uh, could not be a more timely uh, guest for us, considering all that's going on with COVID. COVID-19 in the world right now. Dr. T, thank you for, uh, <laughs> for joining <laughs> us today. You're very welcome. I appreciate you inviting me. It's definitely a tough time in the world, and I'm glad that you, Brian, and you, Nick, gave an opportunity to share with your audience about how to deal with some of the terrible, terrible events that are going on, disastrous events that are going on recently. For sure. Well, um, I, I think that uh, some of the insights that you'll be able to share with your own expertise and background and uh, the kind of work that you do through your organization will be hugely beneficial uh, for all of our listeners. So again, thank you very much for taking the time to join us today. You're welcome. I'd like to kick it off with a little bit of a background on yourself, uh, really talk about, uh, you know, kind of uh, what your uh, your entire um a career path has been that has led you into uh, some of the work that has appeared in your books, uh, as well as uh, the topics that you speak to. Sure, happy to. Well, my career actually began in my childhood. Not in, I didn't actually begin working in my childhood, but it was motivated by my childhood. I saw my parents having pretty bad decisions, kind of somewhat disastrous decisions with each other when they had a bunch of conflicts. So for example, my mom, you know, she likes to wear nice clothes. So she'd go out and she'd buy a hundred dollar sweater and she'd come home and my dad is kind of a cheapskate. So he'd yell at her and say, no sweater should be worth over $20. And then they go <laughs> at it. They have a conflict, they tension, they bring up other stuff, you know, oh, that thing you did three years ago, you know, that's not great. And that was a pretty bad decision. On their part, already as a kid, I was feeling the negative emotions, the harsh conflicts between them. The worst conflict was my dad. So he was a real estate agent and he worked based in commissions and uh, his salary was variable. So there was about a six month period where he made a lot of money, but he hid it from my mom, told her he made very little money and you know, probably didn't want her to spend on sweaters. And so as a result, he bought, well, he bought an apartment with that money and leased it out to some folks. My mom found out in a couple of years and she was very mad. She was very pissed, very angry, very upset. They had a huge blowout fight. You know, she actually ended up kicking him out of the house. So he had to live in that apartment that he bought. <laughs> oh, dear. At least that out. And as a kid, that really impacted me. That was really pretty bad. So not we have that huge fight, not seeing my dad for a long time, living with my mom, obviously. So, I mean, they eventually reconciled, but you could never really trust him fully again after that situation. And that made me fascinated, curious, you know, why do my parents make such bad decisions? And how do we make decisions in general? How do we avoid these sort of disastrous, terrible decisions that result in these huge conflicts, tensions, various sorts of problems? As I was growing up, I was, so I came of age, I was born in 81, I came of age around the dot-com boom, you know, 1999, when tech leaders were partying like it's 1999. But just a couple of years later, when I was 21, 
that was the bust, you know, 20, 2000, yeah. 2002. Sure. All the people who were in the Wall Street Journal for the right reasons in 1999 were in the Wall Street Journal <laughs> for the wrong reasons in 2002. So it showed me that it wasn't only my parents, it was everybody. <laughs> you know, the top, top titans of industry were making terrible decisions. And, you know, some political leaders at that time were also making some terrible decisions. No need to go into politics, but that was <laughs> some of the stuff that I saw around me. So, and nobody taught me how to make good decisions. Nobody sat me down and said, hey, kiddo, here's how you make good decisions and avoid disasters. And uh, nobody taught me that in, in school, in college. So I decided to study this myself. And I started reading on it, learning about it. And as naturally I started talking about this, other people wanted my advice. So I became a coach, consultant, trainer, speaker. So I've been doing that since 1999. So for 20, over 20 years right now. And at the same time, as I went through the sparse literature, quality stuff that's available on decision-making out in the popular world, not the BS of going with your gut and following your intuition and being primal, which is what everybody advises you to do, <laughs> but actual really good advice. I saw that I needed to actually have formal education in this. So I went into academia and got a PhD in the history of behavioral science and some cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist. So I studied these topics, go in depth into that. And I spent over 15 years in academia studying this. And so all of that has been combined in my latest book, The Pragmatic Business Experience of Consulting Coaching for Business Leaders. I also run my own company, Disaster Avoidance Experts of six people. It's a consulting, coaching, and training company. So I'm a business leader myself, of course, small business leader. And my 15 years in academia of cognitive neuroscience, behavioral economics, cutting edge research on how you avoid disasters, the disasters that come because of how our brain is wired and the terrible decisions we make including the kind of decisions we can see in this epidemic. Wow. Well, first, let me say thank you very much for your vulnerability and in, in sharing your personal story uh, from your childhood. It's it's one that for you has had um, potentially a, a much more positive outcome than for many people. So, yeah, uh, I, learned what, I learned what not, not to do for my parents. So my marriage is much better than my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's that's uh, that's wonderful, and thank you for you know transforming that into something that can be beneficial for so many others. Uh, that in itself, I think, is a pretty powerful story. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, I'm I'm curious about one of the things that I just heard you make a comment about, which is how our brains are wired, and I know that this is uh, a central part of uh, some of the work that you do, uh, sort of the neuroscience component of it. Can you speak a little bit about that? How are we wired, and why do we make such bad decisions? Well, there's a reason my book is called Never Go With Your Gut. Our gut decisions, which is what, again, so much people tell, so many people tell you to go with your gut, follow your intuitions, trust your heart, be primal, be savage, Tony Robbins of the world. Terrible advice. Because our gut reactions, our emotions, our intuitions, our instincts are actually not wired for the modern world. You know, the modern world really has been around since World War II, and we have not evolved for it. We evolved for the world of the savannah environment, when we were hunters, gatherers, living in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. So that's what we are evolved for. That's what we're adapted for. So, for example, in dealing with threats, the, which whether dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic threat or the threat of, you know, when we get a nasty email from someone, our immediate response is the fight or flight response. You might have heard about it as a saber-toothed tiger response. In the savanna environment, we needed to deal with intense immediate threats. We need to jump at 100 shadows in order to get away from that saber-toothed tiger. And we had that adrenaline rush, which lasted for a brief period, which got us out of that dangerous situation. That was great for that environment. Pretty bad for the current environment because we have many less saber-toothed tigers right now. <laughs> the kind of threats we face are not intense, immediate life and death situations. We instead face many small threats, challenges, like an email from an irate customer, which we should not deal with using the fight or flight response. You know, the flight in this case would be ignoring the email, sweeping it under the, you know, the mental rug, or writing back saying, no, you're wrong, I'm right, I'm awesome, <laughs> you're, you're a jerk. That neither of those responses will actually help you in a business situation to retain your customers, retain your clients. You need to go against your intuitions, you need to go against your gut reactions, and you need to instead figure out how to incorporate strategically what the irate customer told you into your activities. First of all, calm them down, of course, empathize with them emotionally and so on, and then incorporate what they told you into their activities, into your activities so that you 
perform better in the future. So that's kind of the small threats that make up a pretty big consequence if you don't deal with them. That's one. Now, the second sort of thing is like the COVID-19 epidemic, which is a slow moving train wreck of a disaster. And we are completely not wired to deal with slow moving train wrecks of disasters. That's why you see panic buying, panic shopping, people not making good decisions. You know, you it's good to get a number of supplies that you will use anyway, but you should not you get the whatever, I don't know, canned beef, something like that, that you don't like and that you're not actually going to use. So these are some of the things that you want to be thinking about. And these are some of the terrible decisions that we make because of how we're wired and how business leaders make, professionals make in their personal, in their professional lives as well as in their personal lives. So that is something that you want to be thinking about. No, I really like that. And we're, we're talking about that from a business perspective. The, the thing that always comes to mind for me is the uh, SWOOT analysis, the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And when I was mm-hmm. reading your book, you know, your, your recently published book, Never Go With Your Gut, um, you brought up a very good point that that doesn't really cover um, like every threat possible. Could you explain that a little bit more? Because I thought that was really interesting. So SWOT analysis helps business leaders look at their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. That goes to be the you know, golden standard of how to address the human weaknesses in thinking, the strategic analysis. Unfortunately, it very often provides false comforts because of the way that our brain is wired. And here, we need to get into the specifics of how our brain is wired and how we make decisions badly. These are called cognitive biases. Cognitive biases are the specific dangerous judgment errors we make, the systematic patterns of bad decision making that come from how our brain is wired, whether the short-term response, the fight or flight response. Now, there are a number of other things that go on in our brain that are pretty bad that harm us going forward. So the SWOT analysis, the biggest problem is the optimism bias. Now, the optimism bias is something that is very characteristic of many leaders, including me. So I'm very optimistic, and that means that I see the world as generally positive, nice. I see the world, the grass is green on the other side of the hill, even though it's sometimes actually yellow. You know, I see... I I ignore risks and threats. I focus on opportunities and rewards, and I have exaggerated expectations of myself and of other people, which results in me making a whole bunch of mistakes that I don't need to make. And of course, that results in other leaders making a whole bunch of mistakes that they don't need to make. So when I do consulting, coaching, training, I overwhelmingly see clients who did a SWOT analysis before they started engaging with me, what they do is they list way too many strengths, way too many opportunities, not nearly enough weaknesses, not nearly enough threats. And as a result, when they make their strategic plans based on the SWOT analysis, they ignore a lot of the risks and weaknesses that they have that they should be working on addressing. And they overemphasize their strengths and their opportunities. So they misinvest resources, they invest resources into the wrong things, and then their strategic plans end up being screwed by the mistakes they make. I mean, how many of us are kind of screwed by the COVID-19, right? So who didn't anticipate stuff like this? And this is the kind of things that you want to be thinking about because mistakes due to the optimism bias, due to seeing the future as too positive, too nice. And there are, of course, ways of addressing that, so we can talk about that. Now, the other thing SWOT analysis that's really important to understand is groupthink. Now, the optimism bias is very characteristic of leaders in particular because it creates this sort of positivity, inspiration, and leaders who get to the top, like they inspire others. That's the important, you know, fundamental aspect of leadership. So you often will have people on the team who have the opposite bias, pessimism bias, which means that these people are too pessimistic. They see the grass as yellow on the other side of the hill when it's actually green. That is a strength if you know how to use it wisely. Unfortunately, the vast majority of leaders do not. They are optimistic and they ignore, they shut down people who are pessimistic around them. And so what tends to happen when you do a SWOT analysis, what I've seen, happened too many times is called groupthink, where the opinions that are expressed in the group, regardless of uh, the various personalities in the group, coalesce purely around the opinion of the leader. And the leader who is optimistic results in everyone being optimistic because they don't want to go against, you know, the big alpha monkey in the room, which is where our intuitions, gut reactions are coming from, that savannah monkey alpha environment. So you need to fight that and address that if you want to actually have an effective 
SWOT analysis. You need to fight both the optimism bias and group thing. But the vast majority of people who do a SWOT analysis fail to do so. Well, you make it sound so easy, right? <laughs> Sure. I mean, it's just a, let me be very clear. It's just as easy as it is to avoid eating a dozen donuts when they're staring you straight in the face. And I, I say that for a reason. In the savannah environment, one of the impulses we had was to eat as much sugar as possible, whether it's honey, apples, bananas, when we came across that source of sugar. We are the descendants of those who had a very strong fight or flight response who had a ve- and who had a very strong response to eating as much sugar as possible, sugared by it. So the other people just didn't survive. So we're the descendants of those. And those are inborn instincts that we have in us. That's our gut reactions. That's our intuition. So it's very hard when, you know, one donut is okay, two donuts maybe, but you got to stop at the third donut for the sake of your health, <laughs> especially now that we're all sitting home with COVID-19, not going outside and getting as much exercise as we used to. So this, you know, not going to the gym, right? So especially, maybe you should stop at one donut right now. So this <laughs> is an especially important time for you to not overeat but it's very tempting for us to you know there's a reason that stores so that dunkin donuts sells the box of dozen donuts because they make much more money when they sell them a dozen donuts they you shouldn't be eating that many donuts but that's how they make money <laughs> however that is they know that and they know we're tempted to eat that so this is a big problem for us it's hard to resist this for the sake of our physical fitness and we know we should all the medical researchers whatever they tell us we should so it's just as hard to resist this optimism bias and groupthink and other problems that come because of how we're wired as it is to resist eating the dozen donuts. So I make it sound simple, and it sounds simple to say resist the dozen donuts, but the thing is our decision-making, our behavior is driven overwhelmingly by emotions. About 80 to 90% of what we do, what we think, is driven by what we feel uh, when we just let it and go forward and you know be primal and be savage. So in order to address that, you need to go against your emotions and you need to revise your emotions. And revising our emotions is a pretty hard thing to do. It takes a lot of work, just as, you know, eating well is a lifelong struggle, right? That's right. (laughs) So So is deciding well. So is making the right decision. So is avoiding disasters. It's a lifelong struggle. And most people don't even realize that they're in a struggle. Most people, it's like we're in a society where everyone is just eating the dozen donuts because they're available and, you know, because they taste good. That's the kind of environment that we are in when we're just going with our gut and, and following our intuitions. That's why we have that. We do have an obesity epidemic here in this country. Right. Unfortunately, it's been addressed more in a couple of the recent years, but there's nobody talking about it except me a couple of other scholars talking about how it's terrible to go with your gut, follow your intuitions. It's just like the obesity epidemic and nobody knows about it. Well, of course, I was being facetious when I said you make it sound easy. It's, you know, going <laughs> against human nature, uh, as you just pointed out, uh, is, is incredibly challenging. And I think the first step, and I, I think I heard you also reference this in some of what you said, is achieving self-awareness. Right. It's even it's even having the awareness that there's an issue or having the awareness that you actually have the ability to reprogram in your own mind or your own reactions. uh, Some of the uh, emotional responses that are the the intuitive ones that you feel the impulses to follow. Um, So walk us through some of the techniques. Where where does that self-awareness even begin? What's step one on that mountain? Well, step one is learning about all of these cognitive biases. So there are over 100 cognitive biases that cause us to be pretty screwed, unfortunately, in our current environment. And we have to be very careful to understand that that those cognitive biases, they weren't problems in the Savannah environment. They were fine. They were just a feature of our mind because that that was a natural primitive thing to do in the natural primitive environment. Now we're in a civilized environment. And from being features they became bugs they're no they're no longer they're no longer features of our mind they're bugs in our mind so we need to adapt to the modern environment we need to adapt civilized habits civilized habits of thought that means becoming aware of these bugs in our mind these cognitive biases like I said, there's a list there's a list of over 100 of them on wikipedia it's pretty easy to check out so you can go there now my book talks about never go with your gut, how pioneering leaders make the best decisions and avoid business disasters, talks about the 30 most dangerous ones in business settings and how you can address them effectively. And my next book, The Blind Spots Between Us, talks about the 30 most dangerous for relationships and how to address them effectively. So you want to 
be thinking about learning about these cognitive biases and then learning about the techniques to address them. The Never Go With Your Gut has an assessment at the end in the last chapter, which helps you assess which of these cognitive biases are most prevalent and most dangerous for your workplace. So for example, first question on the assessment asks, hey, over the last year, think about to back to the last year, of that last year, what percentage of projects went over time or over budget? So think about the percentage, just you, know, you listening out there. What percentage of projects went over time or over budget in your workplace? Now, whenever I ask that to when I'm doing a training a group of leaders, and I ask that, you know, some people say 5%, some people say 20%, you know, some people say 40%, some people say 70%. I had one training maybe about six weeks ago when somebody said 98%. <laughs> you know, when it's 5%, it's not a big deal. You know, 10%, not a big deal. And it's getting to the 30s, it becomes more serious. It's getting into the 50s, it's really serious. Because what's happening is that you're misinvesting your resources. You're investing your resources in the wrong projects. You don't know, and then some projects naturally don't get done, don't get the right resources. So that is a big problem for you. And the specific problem, the cognitive bias that's at fault here is called the planning fallacy. Now, here's what the planning fallacy is. We like ourselves, we feel confident about ourselves, and we like our plans. We feel confident about our plans. So we ignore any possibilities that they will fail. That's a tendency. Not all of us, you know, it's not omnipresent, but it's a characteristic of very many of us. So the planning fallacy is going to be a problem for some people and some workplaces, you know, the ones that are 5% is not going to be a problem. The ones that are in, in the 30s and up, and especially in the 50s and up, is going to be a serious problem. So you want to learn about what are the serious problems for you, serious problems for you. The optimism bias is a serious problem for me. So that may be a problem for you. It may not be a problem for you. And you want to learn about these things. So that's the first step. Learning about them, getting awareness, and learning about the specific techniques to address them. Now, there are also two techniques that I describe in the book to address a whole bunch of cognitive biases at once, effectively, whether you're individual or whether you're an organization. So we can talk about those as well. But the first thing that I want to make sure to talk about was learning about these cognitive biases and addressing, learning about how to address each one effectively. So for example, the optimism bias, I, to address that, I learned how optimistic I tend to be, but the percentage approximately, and I bring down my optimism by around that percentage. So if I think, you know, let's say that the an email I'm writing to a client, the client will be very happy with what I'm writing and so on. I learn over time that, hey, you know, I'm being too optimistic about percent, you know, X percent of the time. So if I think, let's say I'm doing a pitch on a webinar to a client, which is what I'm doing right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm you know, sending pitches to clients about webinars. And if I think that intuitively that about, you know, a third of them will be interested. I learned that in reality, maybe about a fifth of them will be interested. So I'm about 60% off base in my estimations. And so that is something that I learn and I adjust my expectations by that amount. That's one way of addressing the optimism bias. Now, another one that I learned for more serious issues for more big projects is to make sure to run my ideas by someone who is pessimistic. And this is very important. I make sure to hire, I said, I run a company of six people. So I make sure to hire into the company some people who are pessimistic, not only optimistic people. Now, I much prefer to work with optimistic people that they intuitively click with me. I like them. They like me. It's like, it's a good relationship. I don't like high, you know, collaborating with pessimistic people because it feels uncomfortable. They shoot down my brilliant ideas and it doesn't feel good. But I know that I need to. This is kind of going outside of my comfort zone, which is exactly the thing you need to do to address the natural primitive gut reactions. Though it's what's comfortable for you is often the exactly the wrong thing to do. And in this case, it is for me. So I know I need to hire people who are pessimistic and make sure to run my supposedly brilliant ideas by them. <laughs> you know, I have 20 ideas before breakfast and think all of them are brilliant. Well, if I give them to a pessimist and they tell me, you know, in my company and they tell me, well, you know, maybe these three ideas can actually work out and then they fix all the flaws in these three ideas and they implement them. The pessimists are terrible at generating ideas because they see the exaggerated flaws of each idea, but they're really good at selecting among a whole bunch of ideas that optimists generate to the, and then taking those ideas, have baked potatoes and finishing baking them. So that is how optimists and pessimists can collaborate together really well. And that's a specific technique for addressing the optimism bias. 
And there are specific techniques for addressing each one of these cognitive biases that are described in the book. Oh, that's a great rundown. And and when you were saying that, it just reminds me of thinking like, you know, people say they they want to surround themselves with people who are just going to, and if they're a leader, they want to surround somebody with people who are just going to do what they say, right? <laughs> For me, I love it when somebody challenges what I'm going to say, because they might be thinking of some idea that I might have no idea. I've never thought of it at all. It might not cross my mind. And this whole COVID-19 thing is, is a good example, especially as we work in technology. It, it's given everyone a chance to actually test, test their disaster recovery plans mm -hmm. and their business continuity plans. I mean, the last time I could think of anything happening big enough, you know, that we've done something like this is maybe 9-11 and it wasn't quite at this scale. I mean, it was maybe for what, maybe a couple of weeks. And this, this is something that seems like it's going to be um, much, much longer drawn out. So what are you seeing out there day to day? Are, uh, you know, are businesses, do they have business continuity plans? Um, has, have, were they too pessimistic in them, too optimistic? Like what, what are you seeing working with your clients? Well, what I'm seeing overwhelmingly, and this is less so the case for my clients than for general business continuity, risk management plans. And to be clear, I work with a lot of risk management professionals, given the device, given insights. A lot of companies, their continuity plans look like the kind of continuity plans for when Houston was flooded. You know, it'll be flooded for a couple of weeks. We'll deal with it. We'll manage. It's going to be pretty bad. And then we'll go back to normal. That's how their continuity plans are structured. They are completely unprepared for the scenario of Houston being flooded and staying flooded. <laughs> that is what we're actually dealing with. Houston being flooded and staying flooded all this time. How do we deal with this? What they're not realizing is that we are in a different situation now. We're in a new normal. And they are operating overwhelmingly in a more in emergency mode. So business continuity, that's supposed business preparedness, risk management, that's supposed to be emergency mode. We'll, you know, we'll switch to this for brief emergency and then we'll switch back for normal. They don't realize that what's happening right now with the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic is very different than what they planned for. We are in a new normal. Now, I say this in a very serious fashion. I don't say this kind of you know, joking or you know, exaggerated fashion. If you look at the top health experts and their investigations of what will happen with the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, what they're finding is that you know, it's not like the flu in that it completely disappears in the summer. It's spreading right now. I mean, right now it's spreading in the U.S. and Florida quite widely, Texas quite widely, which are warm states. So it's unlikely to disappear by the summer. And it's not going to be something that will just, you know, magically vanish because we are we are sheltering at home. There will still be people who don't really follow this advice. So that only lowers the amount of new cases. It doesn't prevent them. Realistically, what will happen is that we will most likely, you know, sheltering at home is going to be pretty hard for a long period. So with government will be pressured to let loose some restrictions and then there will be an increase in cases and medical systems will be getting close to overwhelmed and the government will say, okay, let's go back to, you know, so maybe two, two three weeks of freedom <laughs> until the next shutdown. And that's going to be very bad for businesses which are preparing for which want certainty, don't want ambiguity. And what will, will be the case will be this uncertainty, ambiguity, periods of loosened restrictions and, and high restrictions. Bad for business, really bad. What they're not, that, and they're not preparing for that. They're not realizing that, that we will not have a vaccine for the next 18 months at least. So not by the end, of, until the end of 2021. And that will be available to people like, you know, governors and Jeff Bezos. <laughs> so people who have a lot of money or a lot of power, those will be the people who will be able to get the vaccine. It will take a long time to ramp up, maybe even not about another year. So we are going to be stuck with the coronavirus pandemic situation until the end of 2022, more realistically. And that is going to be very optimistic. That's good. That assumes that the first vaccines that are created are highly effective and they completely cure the pandemic. They completely cure COVID-19. Very unlikely to happen. The first vaccines that are created are more likely to be like the flu vaccine, which is only about 50% effective. So you will reduce the fatality rates by half. That's not good, <laughs> you know, but just a reduction of half from the fatality we see for people 
55 and older, fatality rates in something like 5%. And of course, the older you get, the worse it is. This is a big, serious problem. And so you having just reducing the fatality rate by half is not going to do much. So we will need to work on and most likely other vaccines until we hopefully can create one that's good enough. Maybe it'll be a five years from now. But it's also possible, and this is what the health experts are saying, including the US government health experts, which came out with 100 plus page report on this topic, which is available out there if you want to check it out. It's saying that it's possible that we will not have a vaccine that's better than the flu vaccine. And the flu vaccine is only, like I said, about 50% effective. So it might be possible that COVID-19 coronavirus will be continuing for the rest of our lifetimes. And if it's like the flu, in which case the our uh, herd immunity, so you might have heard the phrase herd immunity, it might wear off in about a year. So when we get sick, the, our immunity to the virus might wear off in about a year, which is what happens for the flu. If that's the case, that will be pretty terrible. And that will mean that it will be indeed a, the situation where it will continue for the rest of our lives. But regardless, in the, you know, that's a, that's a worst case scenario, but realistic scenario. The optimistic scenario is that it will be around for the next few years. So uh, we will be in a series of shutdowns for the next three years. That is not the what the business continuity risk management is prepared for. They're prepared for a two week, maybe you know, month long shutdown. They're not prepared for a three year shutdown. And they're not looking forward to that. They're kind of, mer they are in emergency mode. What they need to do is transition to the new normal. This is the new normal. And what they need to do is look at how their business model will change in this situation they will need to change their internal structure very much. The internal structure right now presumes that people are working in office and you know, for a short period of time, transitioning to working outside the office, telecommuting. That will not work for three years. You'll need to change very seriously your internal structure. And there's a number of ways that you will need to do that that I'm not going to go into right now, but I can if you want to. That, so the, the internal structure, and of course, you'll need to change your external structure, your service delivery, your, whether you're, whatever you're doing, goods product, producing goods, producing services, you'll need to change that very much as well. And you'll need to change your collaboration and networking. Relationships are the basis of any business. And right now, we will not really have too much face-to-face -face relationships. So you'll need to figure out how to do networking collaboration business relationships online virtually those are all things you need to be thinking about now if you start doing that if you as listener business leader business professional start doing that right now you will get a strong jump ahead in your competition who are still in emergency mode so you will be able to be much better off than they are and you need to be thinking about what will you do as they are hobbled by the fact that they're you know in maybe in a few months they realize that they're in the new normal instead of you right now realizing you're in your normal so how will you make sure that your advantage, your competitive advantage that you gain by switching to the mindset and strategy of a new normal right now is going to incorporate taking advantage of seizing market share from your competitors who are hobbled by this situation? Maybe if they go bankrupt, you know, buying the resources at a fire sale, hiring good employees. So right now, what you need to do if you were to cope with the COVID-19 epidemic is to look toward the long term. And that is something that we're completely not wired for. We're not wired to look for the long term because of these short term impulses, the fight or flight response, which is again, what the vast majority of people are in right now. So you want to look toward the long term, change your strategy with having everything in mind that I just described and make sure that you protect your company, your organization going forward into the long term. And of course, your own professional career. Well, it's very sobering to hear you uh, speak to it in those terms. But, uh, uh, you know, I guess uh, playing, playing the, um, uh, the pessimist to some of the, uh, you know, what I, what I would characterize uh, being, you know, more of the realist perspective of what you just shared, um, particularly when it pertains to, uh, to businesses, I, I would say that there's, you know, the potential of uh, the most successful businesses really only being in a position to retain their existing market share versus even seizing uh, competitive market share, uh, given, you know, current conditions. If, um, if businesses are, are struggling, you know, just to maintain status quo, uh, as we get through this, that might actually be uh, a mark of success versus uh, actually being in any type of growth mode. 
Um, I th what I'm talking about is the strategic planning. So your strategic plan is not going to be, you know, you sh your strategic plan right now in the immediate future, yes, it's going to be figuring out how to maintain stability in this short term mindset. But in the three years from now, that's not uh, real. That's not realistic. You will need to figure out how to change your business model, change your business delivery model, internal organization, external organization. And that will give you a way of a competitive advantage against your competitors who will not be able to do that, who are not thinking in those terms, who are not figuring out their long term strategic plan for the next three years at best more realistically five years, potentially the rest of your lifetime. So this is what you, this is where you need to be going, looking at your strategy, including figuring out the market share issues, because, you know, if your competitors aren't serving their clients, you can jump into that gap. Yeah, that's, that's very well said. And honestly, you know, from a, a digital uh, service delivery model, you know, this is something that uh, not only Nick and I have talked about at length, but, you know, we've recently had another guest on where uh, that was ultimately the thrust of much of the discussion. It's, you know, the, the changing nature of what is available through digital delivery uh, as a service model now. It's, it's something that is definitely working to the advantage of businesses that are poised and ready uh, to operate under those uh, conditions versus um, being stuck with traditional uh, service delivery models and their strategies. Yep, absolutely agreed. So could you tell us a little bit about your uh, new book, Never Go With Your with your Gut? Sure. Well, my book, as I mentioned a couple of times for this uh, podcast, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, published by a great traditional publisher called Career Press. That's a available in physical bookstores everywhere, not that anybody's visiting them because they're all shut down, <laughs> but you can get the physical copy through Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, or wherever you get your books. You can also get a digital copy for it and the audio copy is an audible, so it's also an auto audio book, whatever you want to get. Now, the book goes into what I'm talking about, the cognitive biases, the 30 most dangerous ones, and talks about why we make bad decisions, how do you make better decisions going forward. So it goes through the cognitive biases that, and how to address each one, like I talked about how to address the pessimism bias, has an assessment at the end. And then it goes through some techniques of how do you specifically address a lot of them at once, two techniques in particular that I want to mention. One is going to be for short-term decisions that you don't want to screw up. So these are going to be those casual everyday decisions that you want to make sure that you don't get wrong. Another one is going to be for major, really serious decisions that you want to make sure to get as perfect as possible. So again, the first one takes only a couple of minutes, minimizes risks, minimizes problems, doesn't guarantee perfect decisions. The second one, well, nothing can guarantee perfect, but doesn't maximize for perfect decision. The second technique takes about an hour and it's intended to make sure that your decision is as good as you can reasonably make it. So first one, I'll go through briefly for the first one and uh, you know, I can go for the second one as well. So the first one involves asking yourself five questions about any decision that you don't want to screw up. So you want to avoid decision disaster, ask these questions. First, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? So what evidence didn't you take into account? We are very tempted intuitively to cherry pick evidence in favor of the conclusion that we already want to reach. So let's say that you who are, right, we'll go with an email, writing an important email to a client. Let's say, trying to convince your client that you want to do a digital service delivery and you know, you're know you worried about how your client might take it, but you, know, you are tempted to ignore evidence that your client might not like this idea. <laughs> and therefore, well, that will be a big problem for your client actually doing what you want them to do. Now, if you instead look for that evidence and address your client's concerns in advance, including the email that, hey, these are the reasons why they should trust the service delivery model that you'll have, and it will not be as bad as your client thinks it is. Then your email will be much more effective. <laughs> so that's, the, that's number one. Second, what dangerous judgment errors haven't you considered? So think about the cognitive biases that you haven't addressed. In the email, you might not have addressed some of the planning fallacy issues. So the, as you're transitioning to a digital delivery model, you will probably have run into some issues that you're not anticipating right now. So you want to make sure that you address that, think about that as part of the email and tell that to the client that, hey, there'll probably be some issues that we're not thinking about right now, but you know, we'll figure it out together. So raise that in advance, make sure the client knows that. Third, 
what would a trust and objective mentor advisor tell me? So think about that trust and objective advisor. What would they tell you? What would you tell a friend in this situation? So somebody who you trust. What or you know, if you you get about fifty percent of the benefit by asking that question, just asking the question yourself because you take yourself outside of yourself. And you get the other 50% of the benefit by calling someone who's a trust and an objective advisor to you. Or, you know, if you're a millennial, texting them. Next, fourth, how have I addressed all the ways this can fail? So again, think about all the ways this email that you're writing to your client can fail and how you can address them in advance. So perhaps, you know, when you're writing the email, your client and they're reading the email, the client is in a bad mood. Maybe their kids are screaming and running around the house and you know it's, it's a big problem for them. So they're reading it distracted and in a bad mood. Read the email as though you're distracted, you're the client, you're distracted, you're in a bad mood. How can you make sure that the email minimizes any possibility for negative interpretation and draws the client's attention to the most important parts of the email? So those are the things you want to be thinking about and you can revise the email with that in mind. And finally, what new evidence would cause you to change your mind? So what would cause you to revisit your decision? You could say something like, hey, if my client doesn't respond back within a week, I will give my client a call. That can be a specific decision-making point where you revise your approach to the situation. If you don't have the decision-making point, you know, you'll be sitting there and gnawing your nails for a week, waiting for your client to respond, not sure what to do. But if you do have a decision point, you can just let it go and focus on moving on to your next client and doing whatever else you want to do with your life. And those five questions, which just took me a couple of minutes to talk through them, they can save you so much trouble, so many hassles, so much stress, so much time down the road, so much money down the road that it's unimaginable. I mean, my clients who start implementing this really tell me how much benefit they get from asking these five questions about any decision that they don't want to screw up. And of course, it's great for team decision-making because it saves a lot of time. Everyone comes to a meeting, whatever you have, team decision-making meeting, having answered these questions in advance, so having their own answer. And then the agenda for the meeting is structured by the five questions. So you have those five questions that people go through them, talk about each one of them, and then they make a decision at the end. So, so team decision-making is very much facilitated by these five questions as well. Uh, it's a brilliant approach. And, you know, both of us being technologists, I think Nick and I can appreciate the power of frameworks, right? And to me, that's what you just described. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a repeatable framework that uh, can help drive towards, uh, you know, repeatable outcomes. Well, thank you very much for sharing that. That's a, that's a very uh, powerful gift to give us as well as our listeners. And, um, uh, you know, I think uh, it, it, touches on some of the, the brilliance that you've shared with us today. Uh, it's clear why you're uh, as in demand as you are as a, a speaker, a lecturer, and uh, I, I myself am uh, very intrigued about picking up uh, a copy of your latest book. Although I'm, I'm curious how you can, how you can get an author to autograph an audible uh, version of the book. You know, we haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, not yet, not yet. <laughs> And I've really enjoyed your book. I, I, I'm probably halfway through it. Mm -hmm. um, it, it. And it's very well written and it's not super academic. Um, it's down to earth. And I feel like anybody can can understand the information very easily. Uh, you, you've done a good job of putting scenarios in there that a lot of people can relate to. So for our listeners too, you know, it's, it's not highly academic, um, although you do put the academics behind it, but um, you know, you don't super... Um, it's not super high, you know, science journal type academic, but uh, for our readers, it's, it's a great read. Excellent. Thank you. I appreciate it. Having worked for 20 years with business leaders and professionals and all sorts, including a lot of technology leaders, I know how to write for folks who are not <laughs> academics. So that's not a problem for me. You know, I write, I publish peer reviewed journal articles and journals, and I have a lot of citations in the book. But those are in the end, and it's for you know people who actually want to delve into it and go get you know, who want to nerd out at the cognitive neuroscience and behavioral <laughs> economics. That's great. But if you just want to get the pragmatic information and apply it to your business, that's what it's really written for. Perfect. And do you have any books you know uh, that have had a big influence on on yourself at all? I think Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman is the best is the most influential book for me that I want to cite. So it's, he's part of the first generation of cognitive neuroscientists and behavioral economists who have worked on cognitive biases. They figured out how our brains are screwed up. So how specifically the cognitive biases are, how they screw us and all, all those problems. Now, 
my generation of cognitive neuroscientists and behavioral economists is the second generation. We're focusing on fixing them. How do you de-bias the cognitive biases? How do you address these problems in our minds? How do you fix them? Which is the five questions as an example of how to fix the number at once or the pessimism bias. What I gave you is calibration, the first one, where I calibrate how optimistic I am and address that. And getting an outside perspective is the second one where I get a pessimist. So those are two techniques to address that have been shown to address cognitive biases. So my generation is the one that actually works on addressing and solving these problems. But I've been very influenced by Daniel, Daniel Kahneman's work, which has been on figuring this stuff out. So it was very influential for me. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And, you know, there's uh, uh, obviously more books uh, that you've authored as well. Uh, so I think it's fair to give mention to the blind spots between us. I think you referenced that uh, a little earlier. I, I just love the subtitle, uh, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. So that seems to tie right into what you were talking about with the, uh, the second generation of uh, cognitive neuroscientists, practitioners like yourself. That's right. So that book focuses on how to address the kind of problems that we're running, that we typically run into in our personal and professional civic relationships, political, whatever relationships that we have. The book focuses on that and talks about how to do that. Now, as a lot of people are staying home right now with, with COVID-19, a lot of them are running into many more relationship strains than they had to, you know, actually spending time with your wife is not as easy as it seems if you spend 24 seven. So that's the, a lot of people are, really showing an interest in the book because of that, how it can really help them navigate relationship challenges and struggles in this new era of the, the new normal of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Well, I think it's fair to say the insights that you've shared with us today have benefits during any uh, period in your life, let alone a time of crisis, but uh, it's especially relevant for right now. So um, I, I personally appreciate all the insights that you've shared with us today and think it's going to be hugely valuable for our listenership. And uh, I know we've only just scratched the surface with uh, much of what we could talk about. Uh, you're, you're highly in demand and, you know, for uh, very clear reasons, uh, the, the work that you're sharing sharing is important. Uh, but uh, with that said, I, I hope that we have an opportunity to have you back on the show again. I think there's a, a lot more uh, territory that we could cover. Definitely. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you inviting me on the show. No, thank you. And if our listeners are looking for you, where can they find you on the internet? So my books, Never Go With Your God, The Blind Spots Between Us, are available like I said, in bookstores everywhere that are mostly shut down, closed right now, and online everywhere. So check out if you want audiobooks; they're going to be available. No, they are available on audio, Audible. If you want the physical copies or the digital copies, available on Barnes Noble, Amazon.com, and so on. My information itself. So if you want to learn about more about me, videos, blogs, and so on, are in DisasterAvoidanceExperts.com. Again, DisasterAvoidanceExperts.com. Information about training, consulting, coaching, all these services videos, blogs, decision aids, guides, manuals. So check those out. Especially, I want you to check out disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. There you'll find both the assessment on the most dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which I described is in the end of the book, so digital version of it, and an eight video-based module course. So eight video-based modules on how to make the wisest decisions, especially important in this time of crisis. So again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe for eight video-based module course and the assessment. Finally, I'm really available on LinkedIn. That's I'm quite active there. So connect with me there. If you have any questions about anything I've said, I'll be happy to chat about it. Dr. Gleb Sapursky, G-L-E-B-T-S-I-P-U-R-S-K-Y. Well, Dr. Gleb Sapursky, thank you so much for your time today. And, and thank you for uh, uh, the additional uh, link that uh, leads our listeners to uh, materials that they can find benefit from immediately. That's uh, hugely valuable. Yes, thank you. And for You're our listeners, welcome. we'll put all your information in our show notes so that they can grab all the relative links to your books and to your to your newsletter. That's great. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Thank you.